Good morning, everyone. My name is Afghan Nifty. I'm the CEO of the Caspian Policy Center. It's a pleasure to host our second Caspian Security Conference together with NISA Center at NDU. The Caspian Security Conference serves as a forum to bring together scholars, policymakers, and leading think tankers from the region and its partners across the globe to discuss the challenges and opportunities facing the Caspian region in the security area. After yesterday's great panel discussion, this is our second uh, public panel. Uh, yesterday, we discussed uh, roles of international security organizations in the Caspian region. And today, I look forward to uh, uh, a discussion moderated by Ambassador Alan Mustard, which will explore uh, the future of asymmetric and hybrid threats in the region. Uh, Thank you for all attending to these panels and thank you to the panelists and moderators who have contributed immens immensely to this discussion. And I see now today we also have a very good uh, lineup of speakers. And uh, uh, obviously we are doing a second time and this is in Zoom again, but hopefully our third conference will be in person and hopefully we can have it in the region in that perspective. That's what we are thinking about right now. But uh, again, uh, uh, this is a very uh, successful uh, conference together that we are organizing with NISA Center at NDU. So welcome again to this conference, Ambassador Mustard, uh, who's our board member and uh, over to you to moderate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Afghan. Um, before I turn it over to our experts, our expert panel, uh, I want to frame uh, the question of hybrid and asymmetric threats in the Caspian region, first by defining what, what is a hybrid threat and what is an asymmetric, a, asymmetric threat. Uh, hybrid warfare blends conventional, irregular, and cyber warfare with uh, disinformation, what's known as lawfare, which is the misapplication of law to civil society and foreign electoral interference. And if you, you look at that picture, you can see a number of aspects that could potentially pose threats in the region, in the Caspian region. Uh, domination of the information space, for example, uh, used to spread disinformation and propaganda, uh, psychological operations against host country nationals, suppression of civil society, uh, economic warfare uh, that does not involve kinetic warfare, targeted assassinations, cyber warfare, electoral meddling, and uh, buying off of politicians are all part of hybrid warfare. And if you, if any of this sounds familiar, I think it's because uh, we've been seeing it going on for quite a while now, not necessarily in the Caspian region, but certainly in areas in close proximity to the Caspian region. Asymmetric warfare is slightly different. That is tactics used by a weaker state or belligerent in order to nullify the superior strength of a military opponent. And there are a number of aspects of this. One of them is irregular warfare, also called guerrilla warfare versus a conventional army. The classical example of that being the American Revolution when the colonists uh, engaged in guerrilla warfare against the much more powerful redcoats of the United Kingdom. Uh, another aspect is terrorism, uh, a very searing example in American history being 9-11, the terrorist attacks on the United States. War by proxy, uh, which has included in recent years, the little green men going into Ukraine who uh, Russia had plausible deniability that they were Russian troops, although we later learned that in fact they were. Uh, superior real-time intelligence can be an aspect of asymmetric warfare. And then of course, disruption of the economy, uh, disrupting of food supplies, of power supplies, and of water. This is all part and parcel of asymmetric warfare. So today we see the world is focused very much on Ukraine, but there are some potential hotspots in the region, in the Caspian region. I want to name three of them, and then I'll start turning it over to each of our panelists for their five minute presentations. Uh, the first obvious one is Karabakh, which remains a bit of a hotspot. Uh, ISIS K's presence in Afghanistan, which is a threat to the entire region. And of course, the Russian incursions into Southern Ossetia and Abkhazia, which remain uh, hot hot points in the region. Uh, 
This is going to be open for question and answer. I ask that you look at the bottom of your screen and use the Q&A um, tool in Zoom to, propose, to pose questions to our panelists, and I will moderate them. Our first speaker will be Dr. Nurlan Aliyev. Uh, Dr. Aliyev is a researcher in international relations and international security. He has in the past been affiliated with the World Bank, UN Development uh, Program, UNICEF, USAID, and uh, most recently with the University of Warsaw. So Dr. Aliyev, please take it away. So uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the invitation and the, uh, uh, just briefly five minutes. And let's start about the uh, existing uh, or perspective asymmetric and the hybrid, uh, let's say threats. Uh, I'm not going to involve in the, uh, about the discussion uh, on the terminology because of the, there are the different uh, approaches regarding the uh, hybrid uh, warfare and the uh, asymmetric warfare. But uh, uh, regarding the uh, in the uh, regarding the Caspian region, uh, there are of course uh, the uh, main issues. Uh, the uh, Mr. Ambassador already mentioned about the such a uh, uh, conflicts, uh, the uh, semi-frozen or uh, frozen conflicts uh, uh, in the South Caucasus and also the uh, in the uh, close to Central Asia in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, also, the uh, situation a bit, uh, let's say, a bit is going, uh, I think, is going uh, to stabilize. But anyway, uh, there, there is also the threat, uh, such as existing the uh, several branches of the several uh, uh, the terrorist organizations. Uh, uh, regarding the, uh, as a main uh, threat for the uh, Central Asia and also the uh, First Caucasus, uh, uh, we would like it or not, we should mention about the Russia. Uh, Russia uh, has two main goals regarding the region uh, and the strategic uh, goals. Uh, the, uh, first of all, uh, not allow military presence uh, of any other outside powers, especially Western, United States, NATO, uh, and in the, uh, in the basin in the region and also to, uh, to control developments, uh, hybrid car uh, carbon deposits developments, uh, 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 and also the, uh, to control pipelines and the uh, transport routes uh, uh, in the region. So uh, regarding the uh, uh, Russia, Russia, as we know, Russia is a, we can say that Russia is a, uh, uh, is a stronger uh, grid power, uh, Russia is a weaker, uh, uh, grid power and uh, of course uh, Russia you, not only the small uh, let's say actors and also the uh, even the powers uh, we can see uh, use the uh, the several asymmetric approach uh, mainly the uh, asymmetric uh, uh, strategic interaction uh, which Russia used uses currently for instance and the, uh, it can use uh, the regarding uh, this region as well. For, uh, uh, for instance, the, uh, the, I, I think the main issue, main problem, uh, and yes, sorry, uh, uh, there are the two issues regarding the asymmetric uh, uh, threats. Uh, uh, we can divide them to uh, two, two forms. One of them uh, uh, are the, about the uh, non-kinetic, let's say methods, such as the, uh, using the methods of information warfare, uh, propaganda, etc. Uh, 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 another issue is about the uh, about the conventional military uh, uh, military forms. For instance, uh, regarding the uh, uh, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, uh, and the, to some extent the Kazakhstan, uh, the main issue uh, uh, I think the uh, threats uh, from the Russia in the basin is about the uh, coastal defense. Uh, in case of the Azerbaijan, for instance, we have the uh, Karabakh conflict. Uh, we can say that it is the uh, result. We have not uh, yet the final agreements, uh, peace agreements, I mean, uh, between the Azerbaijan and Armenia. And uh, of course, Russia has the troops there, uh, uh, small troops, but anyway, and the Russia uh, can use uh, these troops uh, if, if there will be such a need for Russia. Uh, this is just scenario. Uh, I don't think so. It will happen very soon. Uh, 
Uh, but anyway, uh, another issue is about the, uh, uh, the coastal defense uh, because of the uh, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and also Kazakhstan, uh, all of the uh, post-Soviet littoral states, uh, I think they have their problems regarding the uh, uh, coastal defense. Uh, for instance, just look at the map, uh, uh, the capital city of Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan uh, is located on the coast coast uh, of the Caspian. So uh, uh, in case of the Azerbaijan, for instance, the, uh, the, let's say the huge part of the economy, uh, uh, let's say the, um, also the population are located in the uh, uh, Baku and the adjacent regions. And if, for instance, the, uh, let's say as, as a scenario, Russia uh, will decide one day to, 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 I don't know, to press, to attack Azerbaijan, the better way will be just to use the, uh, to use the uh, sea. Uh, I mean, the, to, to, to use the sea. Uh, uh, and th the same uh, scenario may be realized uh, 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 towards the Tur Turkmenistan as well. Uh, in case of the Kazakhstan, uh, yes, the Kazakhstan capital is far from the Caspian, but anyway, Kazakhstan has the, uh, for instance, Akhtar, one of these main, the, uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, uh, the hubs of the transportation, uh, etc. Uh, another issues uh, I have already mentioned about the non chinating uh, methods. Uh, sorry, uh, how many minutes I have? Uh, five minutes, please. Uh, five, uh, you have uh, you 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 you're you're closing in on the end, but you can go for another minute or so. Okay, uh, just briefly regarding the uh, non chinating uh, threats. Uh, mm, of course, uh, the uh, up to now Russian language uh, uh, are used in the region. Uh, we can say the uh, main uh, uh, the uh, uh, the language, foreign language, which is used by society. But Russian uh, 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 is not a, uh, a carrier. I mean, the Russian language is a carrier of knowledge anymore. And uh, if we look, the, uh, for instance, adults, the youth. They mainly try to study abroad, not in, I mean, not in Russia, in the Western states. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, it can be used by Russia, and they, because of I mean, regarding the to 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 to, to promote it is uh, let's say it is uh, agenda, uh, especially uh, if we consider that the uh, uh, the, the local media, even uh, I mean, the, uh, in some countries, not all of them. Uh, the uh, journals, for instance, or uh, media representatives, you, they used as a main source the Russian uh, language channels. It also can be the, uh, 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 the that's a source of the not threat but uh, Russia's influences. Uh, regarding the Russian uh, software power, it is not so influential. Uh, it has in some countries, uh, for instance, in Kazakhstan. Uh, it has, uh, uh, let's say, uh, huge influences uh, rather than in Azerbaijan because of the, in Azerbaijan also uh, the society used uh, the Turkish media. And uh, I think that if we will, uh, actually we have not the, any the survey, I mean the national survey, but uh, uh, I, 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 I have the suspicion that the Russia's uh, uh, the, uh, influences in this regard uh, are uh, the, uh, more than the Turkish one, for instance. So uh, uh, another issue can be the uh, labor migrants. Uh, because of the several countries of the regions, <clears throat> for instance, the Azerbaijan, uh, not Kazakhstan, not the literal state, but for instance, uh, another uh, uh, Central Asian state, such as the Kyrgyzstan, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, have the huge uh, the labor migrants in Russia. So Russia also, uh, 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 can use uh, 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 such a uh, tools uh, uh, if there will be such a need. So uh, uh, another issue, uh, Doctor. Uh, yeah, please, Doc, Doctor Lee, if, if if you could wrap up, please, and uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, well, yeah, sorry. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's already uh, quite a bit to chew on, and we will uh, we will be back to you with some questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Mr. Eugene Chausowski, who is a senior analyst and program head uh, at the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. Um, he holds a master's in international public policy from Johns Hopkins University and a BA in international relations from the University of Texas at Austin. So, Mr. Chausowski, please. Yes, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you to CPC for organizing this very timely and important discussion. So I think, you know, clearly the Russia-Ukraine conflict has prompted a strategic reevaluation from all of the countries um, in the post-Soviet space, uh, with each of these states essentially reconsidering their own political, economic, and security risks from the conflict, um, and even in certain cases, how they can benefit from it. Uh, and in terms of the outlook for the Ukraine conflict, so the way I see it, there are three broader scenarios for how this conflict can play out moving forward. Uh, the first would be essentially a prolonged or contained war, um, you know, a status quo, more or less of what we're seeing right now. Uh, another scenario would be an escalation of the conflict, uh, potentially to include direct Russia-NATO uh, clashes. And then finally, we could see a de-escalation of the conflict or even a potential political settlement. And I think right now the most likely scenario looks to be the, the prolonged or contained war scenario, uh, though an escalation can't be ruled out. Uh, while a political settlement may become possible, probably only after the military option gets exhausted from, from both sides. So when it comes to asymmetric and hybrid threats to countries in the Caspian region, I think it's important to place those threats in the context of uh, Russia's broader strategic goals. Uh, which are, I think, to weaken uh, pro-Western governments and support pro-Russian or at the very least neutral regimes uh, while undermining EU and especially NATO integration efforts of these countries. So I would contend that the degree of vulnerability of the Caspian countries to asymmetric and hybrid threats, at least from Russia, uh, largely depends on their foreign policy orientation, whether they're Western oriented, neutral or Russia oriented. So in terms of the threats facing you know, Caucasus and the Central Asian countries, uh, most of the states in the Caspian region are not overtly pro-Western. And I think the one exception of course is Georgia, which I would argue is the most vulnerable to asymmetric or hybrid threats. So we all know about Russia's existing military presence in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and we've even seen some rumblings of, of a referendum for South Ossetia to join Russia, although that seems to be uh, on ice for now. Uh, we've also seen efforts at political and security coercion, so efforts by Moscow to undermine Georgia's EU and especially NATO membership bid, not unlike what they've been doing in Ukraine. Um, and then economic coercion. So, you know, it's interesting that Georgia has actually not signed on to, to Russian sanctions. Uh, and then we've seen the potential for attacks against energy infrastructure, as was the case in the 2008 Russia-Georgia war. So really what we have here is a full range of Russia's hybrid toolkit on display in Georgia, whether that's paramilitary groups, political manipulation, economic restrictions, cyber attacks, or, or even media and propaganda. Um, as far as the, the neutral states, I, you know, here I would group uh, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. I think the, the threats come largely in the form of economic pressure, whether that's you know, migrants from these countries that, that work in Russia, uh, potential trade cutoffs or energy manipulation. Uh, and I think Azerbaijan is particularly vulnerable if it moves forward with major projects that would help the Europeans uh, diversify away from Russia. I'm thinking projects like the Trans-Caspian Pipeline, for instance. Uh, and we've seen even today Putin's attendance at the, the Caspian summit in Ashgabat. You know, this is a notable gathering. It's, it, I think this is Putin's first uh, visit after Tajikistan since the Ukraine conflict started. So clearly this is something that's on, uh, I think, Russia's mind in terms of trying to prevent, you know, serious diversification from happening. So um, ultimately, I don't think there's going to be a direct security threat from these countries uh, unless you, the Ukraine conflict escalates in a major way. And then finally, the, the Russian leaning states, and here I would say uh, would include Armenia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. 
So these states are not at a very high risk for, for hybrid or asymmetric threats um, unless they would meaningfully shift their strategic orientation away from Russia. And we've actually seen kind of the opposite um, happen, you know, with uh, Russia intervening in Kazakhstan earlier this year to, to help the Tokayev government. You know, we know about the Russian intervention in Nagorno-Karabakh um, on behalf of Armenia. Um, and then, you know, obviously these interventions have their own motivations. Uh, but I think the point is that, that Russia is not uh, seeking to increase uh, the hybrid or asymmetric threats against these countries, uh, at the very least for its own self-interest in terms of keeping its allies intact and preventing security spillover. Um, this can definitely change in the future. Um, and we've seen even countries like Kazakhstan, you know, as was previously, previously mentioned, that have not been completely supportive uh, of Russia's actions in Ukraine. Uh, but really, if, if any of these countries are seen to be acting against Russia's interests, they can be vulnerable, I think, to, uh, to these threats in the same way that the neutral states or even Georgia has been. And just one last point that I would make is that all of these countries, whether they're you know, pro-Western or pro-Russian, are susceptible to the, the misinformation and propaganda uh, you know, hybrid threat, for sure, from at least from the Russian standpoint. And so just in terms of uh, measures to combat But this is certainly something that we'll see you know, Russia trying to uh, prevent that kind of coordination. Uh, and in terms of Western security, you know, there's things that the US and, and NATO countries can do, such as military, military training with Georgia, uh, cooperation with Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, My apologies, I think I may have just dropped for a second. Yeah, you, ju you just dropped. You might want to uh, uh, rewind for about 30 seconds. Sure. So basically I was uh, discussing the measures to combat and mitigate these threats. And I think um, in terms of the security support, uh, you know, the US and, and Western allies can help to shore up cyber defense capabilities of these countries and really cooperate on uh, joint efforts to combat misinformation and disinformation campaigns in these states. And I think just one last point that I would make is that you know, this can go beyond uh, security. So hybrid uh, problems can come with hybrid solutions. And we've even seen that the US um, has uh, tried to cooperate with allies like the EU in, in competing with Russia in this region. And, and I think a coordination of these efforts across different sectors would be really important. So, for example, we saw the recent launching of the, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment last week by the G7. And this can be geared towards Caspian countries in competing with not only Russia, but also China in, in the economic sphere. Um, and so just to conclude, I think that the more that these countries are connected both with allies in line with shared interests, uh, the better position they'll be to maintain uh, resilience and mitigate against asymmetric and hybrid threats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Maria Amalicheva, who is a professor of strategy at the National War College. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science from Purdue University and a JD in international law from Moscow National Law Academy. So Dr. Amalicheva, over to you. Um, thank you so much for this kind introduction. And of course, um, thank you to organizers for um, inviting me to this conference today. So I um, am in uh, concurrence with um, the earlier presenters who maintain that um, Russia would probably remain the main source of future hybrid threats to the Caspian region. So we'll focus on Russia as well, but I would be happy to pick up ISIS and asymmetric threats to the region in the Q&A if necessary. And if I also um, agree with the previous speaker that Georgia Georgia will uh, be most vulnerable to Russia's influence in the near term. Although um, if we think about vulnerability in terms of dependence, 
of the countries, I would put Armenia in that category. Armenia is dependent um, security-wise and, and economy-wise on Russia, so it will make it vulnerable to Russia's threat. Um, but Kazakhstan, as a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, um, also maintains some degree of economic dependence and security dependence on Russia, so it will be uh, vulnerable to Russia's um, uh, hybrid um, threats in the near future as well. But I think we can also extrapolate from Russia's experiences of using um, hybrid approaches against Tbilisi um, to make some projections about ways in which Russia might deploy information and other hybrid tools against other countries in the Caspian region. So in my very brief remarks, I would like to focus on two instruments in particular. So I, I do think that the so-called in limbo territories, variously called uh, the frozen conflicts, de facto states or Russia's statelets, will be key to Moscow's ability to continue influencing these countries. And therefore, the Kremlin will strive to maintain or sustain these conflict fault lines alive. And second, I think Russia is likely to continue relying on the tried and tested playbook of informational influence in the region. So I'll talk about these two um, very briefly. But I would like to make a caveat, um, a caveat about not exaggerating Russia's ability to project this influence. Russia's recent experiences in Syria and Ukraine and elsewhere have shown the limits of Russia's hard and hybrid capabilities. Russia's hard power has been insufficient to achieve um, the Kremlin's ambitious, ambitious political aims. Russia does lack uh, vast economic and military resources to impose its will on its neighbors. And many of the Kremlin's hybrid approaches have also have been exposed and it will be very difficult to project influence through the kind of direct informational means such as Russia's news media that has been banned in many countries. And I will also add that in the wake of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, Russia has suffered steep uh, reputational costs. Anything that is made in Russia has become highly unpopular outside Russia. And therefore I think it will be more difficult for the Kremlin to use its hybrid tools but it also means that Moscow may try harder to conceal this influence, and therefore it will also be more difficult for the affected governments and external observers to attribute the impacts back to Russia. So with that caveat, as I already mentioned, the existence of contested territories with Russia's direct control or presence will continue providing Moscow with opportunities to maintain a degree of influence over several countries or territories in the Caspian region. And I think it's important to keep an eye on one new trend in the extension of the so-called borderization approach um, to Russia's controlled territory. So borderization, it's a relatively new tactic in Russia's broad arsenal of hybrid tours, tools, and it's been deployed in um, Georgia, South Ossetia in particular. So borderization involves kind of this um, a slow and steady creeping annexation of um, already occupied territories by moving the border markers, by moving illegal fencing, by in uh, installing barbed wire installation. But it's very slow, so it doesn't draw too much international attention. So if Russia's effort at pushing the so-called administrative border line further into Georgia is successful, um, I think this is something that we might expect in Ukraine. If the war of attrition ends in some kind of settlement with another contact line separating Russia's controlled territory from the rest of Ukraine, it could also be applied in other frozen conflict territories if Russia sees strategic benefit of enlarging the territory for geopolitical gains. And this is also consistent with a market change in Russia's foreign policy approach. So instead of seeking to influence a target government by hybrid means, Russia has been prone to grab land that lies on the strategically important land and sea passages. So I would um, contend that you know, um, this borderization approach is something that we should keep an eye on in um, the frozen um, conflict zones. And of course, Russia will continue seeking to influence other countries' policies through information manipulation. And traditionally, Moscow has relied on a three-pronged approach, which involved first, an effort to discredit the West in the eyes of the population. Second, to weaken the country from within using various pro-Kremlin sympathizers. And third, to portray the country 
the target country as kind of a basket of problems to make it less appealing to the West. And I think uh, the, a combination of these three elements will be used uh, in the future in the countries of the region. I think much of the informational effort of Moscow will be aimed at Georgia, particularly in the wake of the European Council's decision to not extend the candidacy status to Tbilisi. So I think Moscow is likely to capitalize on and exploit the disappointment, the disillusionment of the pro-European advocates and anti-European integration advocates to tarnish the image of the West in the eyes of the Georgian population. And we can also expect an effort to frustrate the long and arduous accession process in Moldova and Ukraine. And of course, Russia is likely to continue fueling societal divisions in all countries. And in this regard, I think it's important to keep an eye on a largely overlooked actor in the region, namely the church, the Orthodox Church, especially in Georgia, but also in Kazakhstan and Armenia. This is one of the institutions that may play a kind of a soft power role for Russia in the region. Um, it is difficult to monitor what's being preached in sermons, what information is, is being spread among the Christian communities, so it's kind of out of the public eye, but it can be quite impactful at times of elections and public referenda and issues of importance. So again, I, I wanted to keep it short, but kind of throw some other ideas to the mix and uh, we can discuss those further in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, our final speaker is Luke Coffey, who is now a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute after uh, several years with the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Mr. Coffey also previously served with the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense as a senior special advisor to the Defense Secretary. So Mr. Coffey, would you please take it away? Thanks, Ambassador. And I wanna thank uh, C CPC and the NISA Center for putting together this uh, great event and inviting me to participate. It's of course, um, you know, the last speaker always says this, it's difficult to be last when there's such a great panel. Uh, but I really mean that. Um, a lot of ground was already covered, so I'll just try to fill in the uh, the the uh, the gaps where um, where I feel like I might be able to. Uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Mustard, you gave a fantastic um, overview and, and definition of both hybrid warfare and also um, uh, asymmetric warfare. And, and I would only you know add to what you said uh, by highlighting that. In terms of hybrid warfare, you know, the, the ultimate goal really is to um, erode uh, trust in legitimate state structures in order to create um, a, a local population that would be um, open minded to or more uh, um, uh, more willing to uh, turn a blind eye to more hard power from from a country. Right. So. In that case, we see uh, many examples of this taking place across the, the greater Caspian region. Um, the, the region is, um, is ripe with many uh, of these attributes that help facilitate hybrid warfare. Uh, there are plenty of uh, social and e economic and ethnic cleavages across the region that uh, actors like Russia, but also Iran, uh, to a lesser extent, can divide society to promote a certain message to help erode trust in legitimate uh, state structures. And then of course you have the flip side of this where you have countries in the region like Russia um, accusing the US of course of doing the same thing. Like the events in January in Kazakhstan, there were rumors uh, going around pushed by you know, Russian language media that you know, this was uh, America's next uh, color revolution in the former Soviet Union. Um, you know, those of us working in Washington and have worked either in or around the U.S. government um, uh, only wish the CIA had the ability to orchestrate and coordinate <laughs> such a series of acts in a country like Kazakhstan. Um, so when we hear these things, we think they're comical. But when when the the, the locals are told these things, you know, they, they, it makes them think, and then they do wonder what U.S aspirations or U.S. goals are um, in the region and in their country. Um, 
I want to focus uh, on on three points about how to counter hybrid warfare. Um, and then I want to say just something very briefly on asymmetric uh, warfare. On hybrid warfare, it's my view that if if you have to counter it, if you have to fight it, if you have to deal with it, then you're already losing, right? And that there are three ways that a, a nation state can take steps to improve um, their resiliency to some of these hybrid threats. The first one is on governance and good governance. Uh, I'm not talking about, um, you know, every country has to be a, a Jeffersonian democracy, uh, for example, but people in a country have to feel like they're being governed fairly and that they're being governed well. Whatever system or form of government that might be, that's a, a different debate. But the, the citizen has to feel like they're governed well and fairly. And not only at the nation state level, but also at the local and regional level. And when I give the when I talk about hybrid warfare in 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 Europe, I also talk about the supranational level. I mean, the with the European Union, for example. So that's the first part. If people feel like they're governed fairly and they're governed well, then they become less susceptible to some of these ideas being pushed in hybrid warfare. The second is economic opportunity and economic freedom. If people feel like that they have economic opportunity, if they're well off financially, or at least stable, uh, then they become, again, less susceptible to uh, disinformation and other hybrid tactics to undermine society. And finally is uh, trust, uh, having a professionalized and having societal trust in the security services and law enforcement. If people think that they're policed well and they're policed fairly, uh, then they again become less susceptible to the disinformation and hybrid warfare uh, campaigns. Now, the problem here is that for countries to, what Russia is trying to undermine through hybrid warfare, um, steps that countries could take to meet these three objectives of good governance, economic freedom, and respect and trust in security services. So in a way, the countries of the region are essentially, well, at least in the context of hybrid warfare, they're, they're trying to build a ship while they're already out at sea, which is a very difficult thing to do, I imagine. Uh, so there are plenty of challenges there with that. Uh, finally, uh, Ambassador, on asymmetric warfare, um, the, the advancements in, in technologies have helped both um, smaller states in the region become more capable in being able to defend themselves better than perhaps they would have been able to do several decades ago. And, and this has kind of given an asymmetrical advantage to to even smaller states. So, uh, you know, when we think about the Caspian, we think about coastal defense. It was already mentioned the need for maritime defense and coastal defense. Um, you look at uh, some of the capabilities being created in, in Ukraine domestically, like with the Neptune uh, anti ship cruise missile. Uh, you know, if, if a, a country in the Caspian was able to get a hold of this capability, it would be an asymmetrical way to go against very expensive, modern uh, warships uh, it, it, that you know as, that are part of the uh, Russia's Caspian flotilla, for example. But also, a the asymmetry in um, warfare and security benefits non-state actors greatly. Um, it allows uh, the advancements in technology uh, that we're seeing on the battlefield and also in, uh, you know, with uh, uh, secure communications, commercial drones and the effectiveness of commercial off the shelf drones, um, thermal imagery and, and other advanced optics that are available on, uh, you know, on, in the marketplace and the, the open and commercial marketplace. These capabilities can allow non-state actors to behave like states, or at least have the impact of states on the battlefield in many cases. 
And you know, this is the, this aspect of asymmetry on the battlefield is something that nation states are going to have to take steps and measures to be able to counter and to stay ahead of. So I'll, I'll stop there, Ambassador, um, and I look forward to any questions uh, the uh, audience might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, we do have five questions already, and so I'm going to jump right to them. Uh, the first question for the panel, with the increasing threat of information warfare and the prevalence of Russian propaganda, are there low-cost non-military methods that Caspian states can utilize to limit the impact of Russian influence in this sphere, meaning information warfare and propaganda? So who wants to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll go I'll go first sure, on that. Um, I don't think there are any low cost <laughs> steps or measures that can be taken, methods, um, it, it, whether it's a financial cost or a cost in you know, human resources and manpower. I think that, um, as I pointed out, the, the, the three aspects that make a society resilient against hybrid warfare, trust in the governance uh, structures, economic freedom and respect and trustworthy security services and law enforcement. These uh, reforms in these three areas could often take even a generation. So I, I, I don't think there's any uh, low cost uh, or quick method. I think, uh, I think governments have to understand that this is more of a long term process. If I may just, oh, sorry, please go ahead. Sure, Dr. Omalicheva, go ahead. Very brief to um, uh, what Luke said, I would only add one more thing. Um, uh, the reform of um, journalist education. I mean, we, we, we um, really need to invest. It's not low cost and it's gonna take some time, but we do need to uh, bring up a generation of um, journalists uh, who are ethical, you know, who've, um, you know, you know, um, know what they're doing, um, uh, capable of reporting in ways um, that is um, reflective of the facts on the ground and um, not prone to kind of fall into the trap of alternative facts and so on and so forth. But we should also not forget that um, even in some of the most democratic societies, there will always be some kind of, you know, slant towards left or right, and it also contingent on who funds um, those media resources. So you cannot completely avoid a little bit of like biased reporting, but I think, you know, investing into journalist training, be transparent about, you know, who funds those media resources and do all of the reforms that look um, uh, mentioned will kind of at least mitigate um, some of those malign influences by Russia or other actors. Thank you. Yes, I was actually going to make a, a very similar point. Um, in, you know, in addition to you know um, journalism, you know, active civil society. I think what Luke mentioned in terms of good governance, you know, it's up to you know a, a society to stay informed. So it's it's a it's up to the governed as well. This is an issue that we face. You know, not only in the Caspian region, but here in the United States as well. So I think, yeah, these are not quick fixes, of course, but uh, you know, long-term, dedicated efforts in order to to battle uh, any kind of misinformation and disinformation, regardless of where it comes. And on that point, if I may, just th that's that's why we have so many problems with hybrid warfare ourselves here in the United States. <laughs> We're very susceptible to it. Uh, in some cases, even more so than uh, some of the countries of the Caspian region. Uh, so may I add? Please, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I also supported the colleagues' uh, thoughts about the, uh, about the, let's say, prevention, what, what the, uh, the region's countries uh, can do or should do. I think the main issue is, uh, is about the, uh, the social problems, the general problems that within the society, within the country. Uh, frankly speaking, Russia or anyone else uh, uh, does not create any problem, just use. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, the, uh, the, the, the local governments uh, should deal with the problems of the society, such as the uh, rights, such as the uh, economic rights, uh, property rights, such as the, uh, the uh, let's say, uh, social justice. So uh, all of them uh, are about the uh, so-called uh, the uh, can be used by the so-called uh, uh, hybrid, let's say, how can I say, hybrid strategy, something like that. 
Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. We'll go to the second question. What are the opportunities for cooperation among the Central Asian countries in combating the threat of ex extremist spillover from Afghanistan? What role, if any, could the US or Europe play in counterinsurgency and counterterror initiatives, especially as Russia and China seem to be taking leading roles in Tajikistan in particular? I'll probably jump in and begin. I think the Please. yeah, the person who asked the question kind of hinted at the just one point that I would make on, on this question. It's a very good one. Um, is that this is an opportunity, I think, for uh Eugene, I had given the, the floor even to with uh, Maria. adversaries like Maria, please go ahead. I think Eugene and I, we have similar thinking um, on the problem. So yeah, um, I will echo what he was saying, but um, I will be very brief that, um, um, I, so the United States and the European Union, I think kind of ceded the ground long time uh, ago to Russia and China. And, and most of the cooperation that have been taking place in Central Asia in the areas of countering extremism or countering terrorism has taken place under the auspices of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, where Russia kind of, you know, is a champion. It um, unites Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan with Russia. Uzbekistan has been staying um, away, but, you know, um, once Taliban took over in um, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan has been much more willing to uh, do some kind of bilateral security collaboration and training uh, with, with Russia, plus there is a high cooperation organization. So um, um, other types of exercises and training and war games are taking place under the umbrella of that organization. And there have been also efforts to coordinate CSTO, STO um, training. Um, and so some of the exercises are actually taking place under the umbrella of two organizations. I think the United States doesn't even have a political will anymore to do much. I mean, there's this fatigue, post-Afghanistan fatigue that, you know, um, sit in and um, there is also not, no political will to do much in the area other than some over the horizon operations. So the United States considered using either Uzbekistan, probably Uzbekistan, uh, but where those negotiations are as to kind of setting a center where the United States can conduct those over the horizon operations. We kind of, it's also in limbo. Over to you, uh, Eugene. Okay, Eugene. Yeah, my apologies, I appear to be having some connection issues, but yes, exactly what Maria said. Uh, the point that I wanted to make is that this is actually a shared interest because, um, you know, not only uh, the Central Asian countries themselves, but also uh, the US, EU, China and Russia also all have interest to prevent the spillover of militancy, especially from groups like ISIS-K. So, you know, as we talk about hybrid threats and asymmetric threats, obviously different states feel them differently uh, and from different directions, but I think it is important to make this not a zero sum game and, and cooperate in the areas that actually have shared interests between all of these countries. Ambassador Mustard, if I could just add that um, you know, Russia uses this issue, this very issue um, in its hybrid warfare. You know, of course there are legitimate uh, threats and concerns uh, about spillover from Afghanistan. But for years, Russia has used this issue as a, as a way to, um, you know, help uh, you know, put pressure on regional countries to have more of a Russian military presence or um, to get more involved in the security issues of a, of a country in Central Asia. So while they do have shared interests, they, Russia has also used this in the past to advance its own national agenda. Sure. And if, um, may I also kind of add one more thing? Um, and I don't have a well-developed answer. So the question um, kind of put together counterterrorism with countering violent extremism. I think what is currently lacking in Central Asia is the latter, the CVE, um, uh, country specific CVE programs and collaboration in the region with regard to um, you know, countering violent extremism. Uh, and uh, Russia is not a kind of a, a CVE supporter. Russia is into kind of the harder 
city counterterrorism approaches. But I think what countries really, really, need, really need is those softer preventive and prophylactic measures um, to counter um, the spike in online recruitment by ISIS, for example. Um, this is one of the um, problems, challenges, I think it's important to keep an eye on. Um, and, and so I think there is a space for the United States and European Union um, to contribute to not directly, but maybe through other multilateral institutions like the United Nations or OSCE. They have some more robust uh, programs and initiatives and, um, and, and templates and framework as that, that countries like Kazakhstan and you know, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan can emulate and try to appropriate and implement domestically with the support. Um, so I think both the European Union and the United States can lend their leadership and support to those softer preventive approaches um, uh, in Central Asia and other parts of the world. And I think that could be very beneficial um, in the region, to the region. Uh, right. Just uh, would like to briefly add uh, the, uh, about the Russia's uh, involvement. Uh, I think, uh, yes, I agree with the colleagues. Uh, the Russia, uh, despite this such kind of Russia's, uh, the, yeah, the previous thing that perhaps can be uh, sometimes uh, the scared the region states with the uh, ter terrorism threats from that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, regarding the terrorism, it's a sh shared uh, threats, including for Russia, for China, uh, of course, for Central Asian states and also for the United States. Okay, and in the, uh, I think in the right now there are the such kind of uh, cooperation uh, on the uh, on the terrorism issues between the uh, between those states. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much for very comprehensive answers. We'll go to the next question. Uh, the Russian constitutional amendments of 2020 enshrined a claim to the, quote, unanimity of the state that was established historically, unquote. How can countries combat this domestic narrative to prevent this hybrid threat to territorial integrity and sovereignty? I think if I may, um... As I understand it, this is referencing um, obviously, you know, some of um, Putin's commentary um, on on Ukraine, right? And kind of using that as a, a justification, if you will, of of some of the events that we've been seeing. I would say that it certainly is uh, theoretically a, a threat to a number of these different former Soviet states. You know, how Russia can interpret their their statehood or or their nationhood. I will say though um, that I think the Ukraine case is a bit unique there um, in the sense that from Russia's perspective or from Putin's perspective, it truly um, is the closest thing to a, a competitor in the military uh, space, if you will. So even before um, you know, increased US and NATO support for Ukraine in terms of weaponry, just the sheer size of, of Ukraine militarily posed a threat uh, again, at least hypothetically to, to Russia, whereas, for example, a country like Kazakhstan, which you could make, uh, you know, Russia could make a similar case. I don't think either it, it meets, matches the conditions of having that type of conventional capability to, to threaten Russia or, or the Western integration and particularly NATO integration that Ukraine is seeking. So, uh, again, this is not to say that this is not a concern or a potential threat for these countries, but I would caution to draw a direct line from the Ukrainian case to some of these Caspian states. Other comments? No? Okay, we'll go to the next uh, question. Can the experts, especially Dr. Omelicheva, address the impact of US and EU sanctions on the states on Russia's border. Sure. Um, very serious um, trickle down economic consequences of sanctions, first 2014 um, sanctions and then um, 2022 sanctions. You know, I'll just focus on Central Asia because this is where most of my research um, has been. So, 
I mean, the effects vary depending on um, the degree of dependence or connectivity or vulnerability of those republics to Russia. So as you know, in 2014, Russia unveiled um, the Eurasian Economic Union, um, uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are members of this union. And so um, because of uh, the connection to Russia through the membership in um, that union, so anything that happens in Russia, especially as far as inflation, uh, the devaluing of Russia's currency will have a trickle down effect on um, the currencies of these republics. And we already witnessed that um, right away, um, the SOMs, the currencies of both countries devalued. So the central banks, they had to um, adopt serious measures to prop their, to prop their currency and um, um, mitigate inflation. So in inflationary processes uh, kicked in um, in all of those countries. And um, you know, so Russia had to suspend the imports of some important staples like wheat, um, um, oil, um, so on and so forth. So, so that had um, a lot of impact on some of the most vulnerable um, groups in the population of, this, of these countries. And um, so there is still trade, but though China um, is a number one uh, trading partner for many of these uh, countries, but there is still connection, especially in terms of imports. So that um, had, had, a, had an impact on the economies of these countries. Um, the first presenter mentioned um, labor migrants. So we haven't seen um, the exodus of Central Asian labor migrants from Russia, but many lost jobs um, because of the closure of both foreign and Russian businesses. I think there will be some movement into maybe agriculture, seasonal um, jobs, uh, but we are yet to see, especially once we get the data from the World Bank, because both Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan's uh, GDP is linked to to all the uh, remittances uh, that these republics receive from the from the laborers, and um, Uzbekistan um, is the most populous country. So even though uh, it is less dependent on remittances in terms of the percentage of GDP, but there are many more Uzbek migrants, um, and so employing all, all those will be um, quite um, an arduous task for the Uzbek government. So these are kind of some of the impacts um, we've seen already, but there will be many more as, um, but on the other hand, I think, especially Kazakhstan is kind of walking this very um, tight line between um, inviting um, Russian uh, tech businesses and other businesses who move to uh, uh, Kazakhstan. I don't see, I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but there've been hundreds and hundreds of Russian businesses uh, just recently registered in, in Kazakhstan uh, as a way of avoiding sanctions. Um, so um, the secondary sanctions impact, you know, will Kazakhstan be able to reap benefits of having influx of, you know, new, new taxes, um, new uh, business activity, and still avoid um, secondary sanctions impact. So it's something to, to, to be seen. But we've also seen, um, you know, the Russians buying properties, um, or, you know, the rents been going up, uh, real estate prices have been going up. So you have all these kinds of um, um, trickle down effects. Um, and some of them we've already witnessed, but others are yet to be seen. But definitely, um, secondary effects of sanctions being felt in Russia's neighborhood. Thank you. Ambassador, I'll just add, um, th that's exactly why we need to, we, the US needs to um, handle each case delicately and individually. Um, it's not reasonable to expect some countries in the region that we want to have a partnership with, that we want to engage with, to basically go against you know several hundred years of local economy and commerce and trade um, between their societies and villages and towns and then those that exist in Russia. Uh, so you know while in a perfect world um, countries in the region wouldn't be dealing economically with Russia, the reality is they have to and they have been for centuries and you know we just cannot wish this away overnight and that's why we need to be um, you know we need to be open-minded about how we deal with this issue. Dr. Aliyev, Mr. Chalosovsky, any comments? Uh, as I understood, uh, it's about the uh, United States possible support uh, uh, to the region countries. Uh, I think the United States uh, already done a huge uh, the support. 
uh, first, as I mentioned about the coastal defense, uh, United States provided the, uh, the, the such uh, some kind of uh, radar stamps or the training courses for the military of the, uh, uh, of, the of those regions. And also United States supported the democratic processes in the regions. Uh, one of the colleagues mentioned about the training courses for the journalists. Uh, I know that uh, there's several projects done by the USAID, for instance, and other United States organizations. But uh, uh, in the perspectives, uh, I think uh, uh, United States uh, can uh, continue such a support. But anyway, uh, uh, um, many issues about the region's countries. Uh, I mean, it depends on the governments of the region countries. So, uh, uh, what kind of uh, exact uh, support? Um, I, I, I may, may, I, I may uh, mention about the, uh, for instance, uh, about the, uh, the, the military support. Uh, to somehow to, to, to help uh, uh, region countries, for instance, to increase uh, their uh, defense uh, uh, capa capabilities, uh, such as the, uh, uh, the, uh, regarding the coastal defense or other uh, strategic issues, perhaps. All right, thank, thank you very much. Uh, You're welcome. We'll, uh, we'll go to the next question, unless uh, Mr. Chalosovsky, unless you have a, an intervention on this one. Just one oh. quick point that I would make, sure. uh, basically, is that you know I would I would certainly um, encourage for for the U.S. to in this region to pursue you know what I like to call strategic connectivity um, as opposed to weaponized connectivity. So when you were talking about sanctions, this is clearly an issue that the U.S. has an interest in in um, you know using as a pressure tactic against Russia. But you want to limit the the ripple effects, if you will, mm -hmm. on on countries that are not. You know, um, in any way, essentially involved in in the conflict in Ukraine. So I, I would encourage, you know, sort of along the lines of my opening remarks, you know, the pursuit of of both U.S. and regional efforts with U.S. assistance on things like infrastructure connectivity, you know, energy connectivity, especially when it comes to green energy and efforts and digital connectivity as a means to, you know, uh, mitigate against the the impact of sanctions and and have a more constructive approach there. Good, thank you. Uh, the next question, can the US and EU uh, play a role in countering far right populist and pro-Russian narratives in Georgia? If so, what measures can be taken to decrease uh, its influence while maintaining an open media environment? I'm, I'm not sure what the U.S. government can directly do any more than what it's already doing. Other, you know, the good governance stuff, uh, helping uh, you know the the Georgian civil society continue to develop and grow. But I think that you know, the, the, in a country like Georgia, where there's a lot of, um, at least uh, among certain parts of the society, discontent with perhaps the way some things are being handled in terms of Euro-Atlantic aspirations. There's a, almost a desperation by people to think that the United States can like just magically solve some of these problems. And unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so I think from a US point of view, we have to continue demonstrating that the door is open, the Euro-Atlantic door is open to Georgia, that we want to engage with the Georgian government um, where possible to help them along the way on their Euro-Atlantic journey and their path. Um, our civil societies should be working with Georgian civil societies to help build bonds and, uh, and, and deepen our relationships. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, there, there's not much we can do in, or nor should we do in terms of, you know, getting involved in domestic Georgian politics. Um, so that's my take on this. I may jump and um, just maybe Please. a little bit of a conceptual clarification. Um, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that whether in um, Georgia or in Europe pretty large, um, far-right populist movements come in so many shades and stripes. Some of them are 
pro-European integration. Others are anti-European -Europe, and anti-NATO. Some of them are pro-Russian. Others are anti-Russian. Some of them, you know, for something, others are against these same things. So they are so um, kind of ideologically fluid and diverse. Um, so, and a lot of them are anti-Russian, but it doesn't mean that the things that they do and say don't serve some of the Russian interests. Because in the end, anything that is on the extreme kind of amplifies um, some of those, some of that societal discord. Anything that on the extreme can be exploited uh, by actors like Russia. So, um, so I agree with everything um, that Luke said, because in the end it's about, you know, um, uh, investing in good governance, but also investing in kind of building society that is robust to different types and forms of conflict and, and dissent, because even anti-Russian uh, far-right groups can still create kind of fault lines within the society that will, for example, prevent or hamper Georgia's integration in, into Europe. So that's one point I think that's important to keep in mind. And the second point that I want to make is that um, what the United States can do and European countries can do better is to invest into their own reputation, because the things that Russia exploits is um, everything that is going on domestically in the United States to show how uh, democracy is so flawed um, that the United States is dealing with extremism, is dealing with kind of the rise of conservative and, and radical um, you know, um, uh, sentiments and, and values and, and attitudes and so on and so forth. So if the United States wants to be able to wield its soft power, it really needs to do much, much more dealing with domestic problems so that you know, actors like Russia cannot weaponize those domestic challenges to tarnish um, you know, um, ideas of liberty and democracy and so on and so forth. So those are the two cents I would like to add. If I may just quickly follow up. I mean, I completely Please, go ahead. agree with, with Maria. I mean, when we're talking about countering far right and populist narratives. I mean, this is something that the US and EU face very much, you know, on, on the domestic front as well, uh, which can be, you know, um, as she just mentioned, you know, used for, for manipulation. And so I think here, you know, best practices on doing this on the home front and then applying those, uh, you know, in places like Georgia or elsewhere. So kind of counter polarization efforts, working with, you know, uh, more elements of both sides of the aisle, whatever that may be, um, in the respective countries, and then really trying to apply it. Because if, if the US or EU is struggling um, with this on, on the home front, that makes it increasingly difficult to, to you know, help with those measures um, abroad. Thank you for that. Anything else from anybody? No, well, then we'll go to the, uh, the next question. The wider development, deployment, and impact that drones have in conflicts, including the Second Karabakh War and now in Ukraine, does the availability of affordable alternatives from Turkey and Israel prove that there are ways to combat asymmetric warfare? Does this pose a threat that uh, NSAs should, could gain access to non-state actors, could gain access to militarized drones? Yeah, uh, Luke, do you want to take that? Yeah, I, I did mention this. Um, the the commercially available drones um, out there on the market now, I think, allow non-state actors to have better situational awareness uh, of the battle space in a way that would have been um, inconceivable, um, you know, ten or fifteen years ago. Uh, I don't think we're quite to the point of like very effective armed drones. I know some commercial drones have been modified to like drop small munitions, but I mean, you could hardly compare that to a Bahraktar or, or a Predator or a Reaper. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think that nation states will still enjoy dominance over armed drones and that capability. These are very expensive platforms that require a lot of training and a lot of maintenance. I mean, one Bahraktar, uh, unit cost is about $5 million. 
And, and when people think of a drone, they just think of like the drone or the UAV. But behind that UAV, you have the ground command center for a Barakhtar, that's another $5 million. And you would like to have at least more than one if you're in a war. Uh, and then you need to have drones that are available for, uh, for service personnel to train on. Then you need maintenance crews and spare parts. And then you need munitions, which aren't cheap. So a, a relatively inexpensive drone like the Barakhtar, which you know, compared to other counterparts around the world, it is relatively inexpensive. When you start adding all the components to it, it's actually quite expensive. And is it at the price point um, that a non-state actor could, could meet? But even if it was at that price point, would a non-state actor be able to access this on the market? And I don't think right now that's the case. Uh, I would like to add. Uh, so regarding the alternatives to the uh, Israel or Turkey produce uh, the UAVs, so uh, for sure uh, there will be because of uh, there will be. Uh, it's already started the competition about it. Uh, for instance, recently even Iran uh, opened in Tajikistan. It joined, uh, joined uh, what's called factory plant, uh, uh, which uh, which will produce uh, the drones. So uh, China, uh, there and the, I think the China also uh, uh, is improving with such uh, capabilities. So uh, in the coming years, we will see. I think we will see the. Uh, uh, the, let's say uh, strengthening of the competition on the uh, on, on 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 drones. So thank you. Thank you. We'll go to the uh, the next question. Have the sanctions placed on Russia and its subsequent economic pains reduced the potential that Russia has to exert economic? suppression or influence on countries in the Caspian region? I, I think to a certain extent, that's a, a fair argument to make um, in terms of you know, Russia having a more limited um, capabilities or more limited resources with now its focus um, on the Ukraine conflict. But that being said, I, I don't think that that completely eliminates the potential uh, for, for Russia to, to exert this kind of suppression um, or influence. And that is where I would kind of, you know, reiterate what I had mentioned before on looking at the kind of, you know, each country is it's kind of its own unique case. I don't think Russia has, a, you know, a one size fits all policy when it comes to, you know, hybrid uh, warfare. And so that's where, you know, the countries that are more uh, Western oriented, um, are, are still vulnerable, you know, and we've seen even, you know, wh whether that's Georgia or even looking a little bit outside the Caspian region to countries like Moldova, right? Um, I think that's a, that's a reminder that depending on uh, the threat perception that Russia has and also its, its resources and capabilities, I think that does remain still uh, something that's in play. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I would, would also extend the argument as to why, even though, sanctions have limited Russia's economic capabilities. Despite that, Russia will continue wielding influence over governments and economies, economic influence for the following reason. So take a look at European Union. European Union decided to undergo long-term but systematic reform of its energy sector to decouple itself from Russia's energy import. So this exemplifies that for other countries that are dependent on Russia economically to become less vulnerable to Russia's economic influence, they too need to be willing to implement some drastic um, systematic reforms of their various economic sectors. And to me, the, I, I think there is, like, there is a lack of political will in many countries to do that. Why? Let's use example of Central Asia. Central Asia, many countries are still, I mean, for the lack of a better term, kind of neo-patrimonial states where economy and politics are run by the patronage networks. 
uh, or call it par corruption, uh, patronage, patronage networks, whatever. So the bottom line is that the economies are set in ways um, that allows um, certain elites um, to benefit the most to kind of to siphon rents off, you know, energy uh, extraction and imports or other businesses. Okay, so um, there is kind of that um, element of personalistic um, uh, benefit from the way the economy is run and connections to Russia. So unless the countries will find the political will to reform the way their economies are run in ways that will make them much more transparent, market-based, like not, not only like uh, on paper only, but meaningful like market-based reforms. I think there will, uh, that continued economic dependence in Russia that will allow Russia to still exert economic influence over those countries, even though it will um, lack the kind of resources that it used to have pre-war, pre-sanctions. Um, but I think, again, short of those kinds of economic reforms, there will still be those vulnerabilities due to dependencies, due to the way those economies are structured. Um, so even with the lack of resources, I hope I made sense <laughs> with my answer, but thank you. No, that was very good. Uh, Dr. Aliyev, any comments? Uh, so uh, it is difficult to say uh, uh, what will be because of uh, we are, uh, I think, unfortunately, we are in the midst of the war in, the, in Ukraine, Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. And uh, it, the war is an unpredictable uh, business, as we know. So regarding the, uh, whether it will listen or not, uh, frankly speaking, uh, uh, I think even it may increase Russia's influences in the Caspian region. Uh, uh, why? Because of, uh, for instance, today Russia is, uh, 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 in, uh, today, I mean, the, uh, uh, Putin's visited the Ashgabat, the, there the happens the uh, summit. And uh, I think uh, in, in the sanctions, the, 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 uh, let's say, uh, staying in competition with the West, uh, Russia will try, at least will try to strengthen its position uh, in this region, especially in Central Asia and in the uh, South Caucasus. Also, will use uh, its uh, economic influences because of uh, all of those states. Yeah, we can say all of those states uh, economically uh, 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 has a close relations, economic relations with Russia. So it will take the uh, several, I don't know, years to diversify, uh, diversify their uh, their let's say economic relations. For instance, in case of the Azerbaijan, the, uh, Georgia, the, uh, most of their uh, grains uh, came from the Russia. Okay, so uh, it is difficult. Yeah. Say, it is uh, difficult. It is yeah. difficult. Uh, the next question is directed to Dr. Omalicheva. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in hybrid warfare? I have seen the church playing something of such a role in the Balkans, but can she talk about such a role by the Russian Orthodox Church in the Caspian region? Would such a role be limited to Georgia and Armenia? Can it also play a role in Russian hybrid warfare efforts as well? Sure. So um, uh, for full disclosure, I'm not an expert in Russian Orthodox Church, but um, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to drop a link to a very informative policy memo that um, explores the role of the Georgian Orthodox Church in Georgian politics. Um, so it gives a lot of examples, but um, uh, so we know that domestically, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church has been the right hand of the Russian government. Uh, the Russian government has benefited from uh, the Russian Orthodox Church kind of spreading, disseminating those conservative values, family kind of um, traditional values and so on and so forth. So it's been really, really critical for the government to be able to stay in power and uh, kind of uh, claim, lay, levy claims to Russians' allegiance to the state 
to, to, to the party in power, to the president. But because of that connection between Russian Orthodox Church and the Kremlin, um, there have been a lot of push against uh, Russian Orthodox uh, Church um, direct visible influences in other contexts. You know, we know what happened in Ukraine, that separation of the Orthodox Church from um, Russian Orthodox Church. So, um, so, but it doesn't mean that there are no other indirect ways in which Orthodox Church can influence uh, societies um, in the Caspian region. And so one way is, is of course through the values, right? Through uh, the dissemination of those kind of conservative traditional values, you know, marriage, you know, patriarchy, uh, allegiance to the state and, and, and so on and so forth. And Russia can benefit from that because it's kind of a part of um, so-called so soft power um, that Russia claims to be kind of that last bastion in Europe um, in terms of defending those values. But I think there are also another way, um, which is through emulation of the relationship between the Orthodox Church and the government and how the government can weaponize church for its benefit. And I think even in the context of Georgia, but also in the context of Kazakhstan, I, again, cannot prove, but I think there is an element of emulation of how other countries can um, benefit from their support to the church, uh, to the Orthodox Church, um, for their political benefits and, and uses. So for example, in, in the context of Kazakhstan, we have you know, Islam as the main religion, but Orthodox Church is also one of the mainstream religions and both the, the, um, the Muftiyat and, and the Orthodox Church, they use their position of power to uh, kind of eliminate any kind of threats coming from non-traditional religions. But it was also beneficial to the government itself, which has been threatened by those non-traditional religions um, whether you know non-official um, Islam or um, you know evangelicals or or you, you know you name it that come as threats to the Orthodox Church, so um, I think it's you know by emulating the ways in which um, the state itself can benefit from this you know productive relationship with the church, I think that's another way in which indirectly you know kind of Russia can benefit um, from um, the church's influence. But I, I will make sure to drop a link where um, some of the more specific examples of how you know church can um, influence politics, can influence society and can benefit to Russia in the context of Georgia. So I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to make one comment, remind everybody of what Samuel Huntington wrote in Clash of Civilizations and contrasting Islam, uh, Western uh, Judeo-Christian uh, tradition and uh, Christian orthodoxy. Um, he said in the Judeo-Christian Western sense, uh, uh, God and Caesar are separate in Islam, uh, God is Caesar, and in Orthodox Christianity, Caesar is God. Um, and I think if you think ponder on that, some of this will become clear. Uh, we have three questions left. Uh, with the three questions we have left, I'm going to, we only have about seven minutes left. Uh, I'm going to pick one person to answer each one and ask you to keep your response to two minutes. So the next question is, when it comes to hybrid warfare in Russia, should the West necessarily work on countering the hybrid threats by being on the defensive, or would a more aggressive strategy, perhaps active hybrid warfare against Russia and hybrid attacks on it, work as a better deterrent, or would this risk further escalation? Uh, Mr. Chausovsky, I'm going to ask you to answer that one. Two minutes, please. Lee, so I, yes, so I, I think that there this does. Um, risk further escalation and we're in a bit of a slippery slope situation so i think that the you know the west could increase certainly um some of its hybrid attacks you know uh, on russia but if you think about it in in the cyberspace for example you know um i think it's caught many by surprise why cyber attacks haven't been used more um in the in the ukraine conflict whether that's by russia or by the west against russia and i think there's a very good reason for this is because this could, you know, uh, truly be very painful for both sides. And I kind of equate it to, you know, a mad or a mutually assured destruction that we saw, you know, back in the Cold War for, for nuclear attacks, for example. So 
uh, instead of uh, perhaps a more aggressive or more uh, offensive strategy when it comes to hybrid attacks, although that should be used to a certain extent, I would argue, um, I, I would advocate more for constructive you know, forms of engagement with the countries themselves. Uh, and here, that's kind of where I get into that, you know, the weaponized connectivity versus the more strategic or constructive connectivity, because the more that you use uh, such hybrid attacks, the more vulnerable you are on the home front, whether that's, you know, in the US right. or in the EU. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ali, if I'm going to give you the next question, has Armenia's, Kazakhstan's, and Kyrgyzstan's membership in the Eurasian Economic Union helped, hurt, or had no impact on their ability to evade Russia's asymmetric and hybrid warfare tactics? Uh, until the day will, uh, that they meet Russia's interests, interest, uh, uh, Russia will not, that say Russia will not directly attack them. But regarding the asymmetric threats, I think uh, such institutions uh, are not helpful because of, uh, again, Russia uh, uh, understanding its weaknesses, Russia uh, tries and will try uh, to keep under control uh, those countries, including those countries, uh, using the uh, asymmetric strategies. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the last question will go to Dr. Omelicheva. Uh, given what was said, <laughs> excuse me, about the U.S. departure from Central Asia and reduced political will after the Afghanistan pullout, what are the highest priority actions you think the U.S. government needs to take to assist these countries with their sovereignty and independence in the face of the Russia-Ukraine war? Sure, thank you. I think the United States has done a, a good, um, I mean, the right thing, even in the most recent strategy um, um, that just recently been published. It is uh, geared towards facilitating um, regionalism, regionalization, creating actually the region um, that has been, you know, anytime, you know, we talk to Central Asians, the first thing they say, we are all, you know, standalone in individual countries. I mean, so really, uh -huh. they're so much interlinked, like there are problems with um, the energy grid. Energy grid, if uh, it is not rebuilt, restored, there will be so many more um, kind of fault lines, um, kind of the flashpoints, uh, conflict. I think much more can be done on climate, climate related water um, in particular. You know, that's another flashpoint that may potentially uh, spill over into some kind of, uh, you know, conflict. I think I would just, you know, energy and climate change related uh, kind of insecurities. Um, in the context of the region as a whole, should be the United States priority, given the scarcity of resources. Thank you. And with that, I am going to use the last two minutes to turn it back over to the CEO of the Caspian Policy Center, uh, Mr. Efkan Nifty, for his closing comment. Ambassador, thank you so much for excellent moderation of this panel. Uh, this was a very good insight. Uh, Tightful discussion, and I hope our audience also joined, enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists as well uh, for being part of our endeavor today. Uh, hopefully, we can have these conferences in person down the road. That's our uh, thinking. And uh, we had a lot of people joining all around the Caspian region and the US to this conference. I'd like to thank all of them for taking time and being part of our engagement. Um, I'd like to thank uh, NISA Center for being partner at this event, uh, especially Dr. Kangas and his team. Also our team at the CPC, especially Nicole Wolkow and others who are uh, put a lot of effort to bring together this conference. Uh, we aim to bring about also new voices uh, in the uh, area as well. We are trying to come up uh, with uh, new ideas uh, in the sense to understand the emerging challenges in the region uh, because Things have become more dynamic, things have become more um, fragile in many places as well. So uh, in the past, we used to discuss more on the economics and uh, economic and business energy about the Caspian region. With this conference, we opened a new chapter of discussing security affairs in the region. Uh, again, uh, on behalf of the Caspian Policy Center, I would like to thank everyone for attending and uh, we look forward to seeing you in future uh, events. Thank you so much. <laughs>